Hey, what's up fiber folks? Welcome back or welcome to High Fiber Knits. My name is Emily and today we're getting caught up with a podcast episode. So if you follow me on Instagram at High Fiber Knits, uh, you may have seen that my family recently lost my nonna. Uh, so that's why there hasn't been any uploads or any filming for the past handful of weeks. Uh, but I wanted to say, honestly, like the most sincere thank you to everyone who reached out to me to offer their condolences to, you know, remind me to stay gentle with myself, um, sharing their own experiences of, of grief. It's it was really moving um, I'm like getting emotional now. It was really just so beautiful to to see the community come stand behind me and, you know, remind me that it's okay to be gentle with myself. It's okay to not like be productive all the time um, and to sort of let myself experience this sort of season of my life as as it is and and not feel like I, I need to experience it any certain way or or do any specific kinds of things and you know I just appreciated it so much so thank you everyone who who reached out um it meant a lot it really did however uh the past couple of days I've been doing parent-teacher interviews. I, I've done north of 60 parent-teacher interviews over the past couple of days, and we were doing them remotely, so I actually did them from my nonna Giovanna's house. I got to spend some time with her between meetings, um, share a few meals with her, and she was practicing her knitting. So it was really nice to just sit with her and, and knit for a little bit over the past couple of days. And, you know, as we were, as we were chatting, like my, my soul really, like I really needed that. Um, but as we were chatting, I, I started, you know, thinking about new video ideas for the rest of the fall and winter um, and, and just starting to feel really excited again about filming. So pretty much as soon as I finished my last interview today, I, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to sit down and, and film. I don't care if it's not the most organized podcast ever, um, but I, I think it would just feel good to check in with myself on how my knitting's going, let you see what I've been up to. I've got some finished objects. I've got some works in progress, lots of works in progress, I feel like, uh, and some acquisitions. So Thank you for your support so much. Thank you so much. Um, like knitting as a whole has really taught me how to slow down and have patience and, and give myself grace. So just thank you. I Like I don't even know what else to say, um, honestly. <laughs> so we're just gonna jump right into it. The first finished object is something I'm really excited to share with you because it's a pattern that I've wanted to knit for so long uh, and it's my Easy Headband by Sari Nordland. Now I've wanted to knit this pattern for so long but it's essentially just a stockinette tube. Sounds simple enough, right? However, it starts with the provisional cast on, you knit your tube, you make your little Mobius twist here and then you stitch it together at the end. But I have tried to cast this on about a half dozen times. I have attempted all the provisional cast on methods I can find. My preferred method of provisional cast on is a crochet chain um, for like camisoles and things like that where you do the straps last. That's how I cast those on. However, because this was a larger number of stitches, I kept twisting my crochet chain. I just couldn't get the cast on right. So I was like, you know what, whatever. I just ended up doing a loose long tail cast on and then a loose bind off in pattern at the end. And then I mattress stitched the two edges together. 
So you can see that, you know, this inside here, there's a yarn end, not super tidy. That was sort of the first half of the mattress stitch that I worked on. But this more external side, I think, or the side I've chosen to be the outside of the tube, I think looks a lot neater, a lot tidier. Um, I'm actually quite impressed with how well this grafting turned out. There is a little bit of like a, a nub or like a bulge here where I had to secure the yarn ends, but overall I, I don't mind it. It doesn't bother me when I put on the headband. I think it still looks lovely. I think, you know, the colors and the overall look of the headband are more eye-catching than whatever like minor imperfections there are at the back. So I am like beyond pleased with, with how this has turned out. Aside from my issues with the cast on, like I said, it was a really easy knit because it was just a stockinette tube. But what made this so special for me was the yarn combo that I worked in. So the main yarn for this is Magpie Fibers Swanky Sock in the colorway Voices Carry. So this is a four ply fingering weight, fingering weight base. It's a sock yarn, merino, nylon, cashmere. Uh, and this was my little birthday treat to myself. And I'm obsessed with this colorway because it's got just this perfect balance of moodiness with sort of the tone of the green and the speckling in the black and the toffee and the sort of ochre colors, but it still has this beautiful glow to it. I don't know how, I don't know why, I can't explain it, but, but this yarn I've been drawn to for so long. Um, and so I treated myself to it for my 24th birthday and I knew I wanted it to be something special. I do have enough left of this to make a pair of socks, but I'm undecided on whether it will become socks or um, if I want to do a pair of mitts to go with this or maybe a Sophie scarf to go with this. Undecided, but I do have like 75 grams or something like that left of this. This really did not use that might be a boost. Maybe it's like 70 grams, um, but I really didn't use much for this. The mohair that I've paired it with is one of my favorite mohairs. This is the Gepard Garn Kidsetta in the color 880. Might be 088. Um, and it's like this seafoam green, emerald, not quite forest green, uh, but I thought that it would pair really beautifully with the tones in the magpie fibers. A couple of the reasons I really like the Gepard Garn Kidsetta, well, there's actually several reasons. It's very comparable to the Knitting for Olive Soft Silk Mohair uh, in terms of the color range that is available. But what sets it apart, in my opinion, from the Knitting for Olive is, one, the price. It's about $3 cheaper, $2, $3 cheaper per ball uh, where I can purchase these yarns um, to get the kid set up over the soft silk mohair. And another reason I really like the Gepard Garn Kid set up, um, compared to the soft silk mohair from Knitting for Olive is... I think there is a noticeable difference in how shiny and lustrous this silk mohair is over the Knitting for Olive one. I mean, the Knitting for Olive still has some shine, but I feel like this is just unmatched. Um, and I have found that that's consistent across the colorways for both of these yarns as well. So for something like, like a sweater, you know, maybe the, the shine, the luster isn't as important, but I think, you know, the pairing of this yarn with the magpie fibers, you really get that, that glowing look I'm completely and totally obsessed with. So super pleased with this yarn combo and how this turned out. 
I did knit this with magic loop on three millimeter needles so it is a bit more of a dense fabric I think the pattern no the pattern did call for three millimeter needles never mind ignore me three millimeter needles magic loop I used my Chaogu fixed circulars for this so really thrilled with how this has turned out I think a matching pair of mitts would be absolutely wonderful I just haven't decided yet if I want a mohair mitt or if I want to just hold the magpie fibers double and and call it a day we'll see tbd next finished object is another one I've shown you before uh, this is an unblocked row stitch dish towel this is a free pattern by Pearl Soho, and it features this really beautiful, this really beautiful stitch. Now this stitch is created by uh, alternating rows of knits and pearls, uh, and knits and knits through the back loop. So this knit I really enjoyed because it was mindless enough that I could take it on the TTC and small enough that I could take it on the TTC uh, but there's also just a little more interest to it than basic stockinette stitch. I knit this out of yarn that was gifted to me from Hobby for their friends challenge on Instagram last month. So this is the friends cotton which is 100% uh, cotton yarn uh, and this is in the colorway oat milk. And what was really convenient about this project was I just cast it on loosely and I knit until I thought I was nearly out of yarn and I cast on and snipped the tails. So this was a zero waste project, which I really, really loved. And I really enjoyed working with this yarn as well. The weight of the yarn is not quite fingering, not quite DK. I do think it's more in that sport weight range. And I did knit this on a three millimeter needle. So it does have a nice drape to it. Again, it, it's warped because it's not blocked, but you can imagine it'll, it'll grow quite a bit. And a couple reasons why I really enjoyed working with this yarn are as follows. First is in terms of, of cotton yarns, I didn't find it felt rough or had that really dry feeling. Uh, it felt very smooth to work with and it glided across my wooden needles really, really easily. I had no troubles with tensioning it. Um, I did knit most of this continental and so I tension over my index finger and around my ring finger and the yarn glided very smoothly through my tensioning. Um, it does have, I think, some elasticity to it, which comes from the way the yarn is, is plied and the twist in the yarn is quite nice and quite strong. I do think this hobby Friends cotton is very appropriate for homewares, but it's also fine enough that you could get a very comfortable garment out of the yarn. And I am actually thinking I might um, use the three remaining balls I have of, of this yarn in this colorway to knit like a sleep top uh, or something like that, because um, one of my most worn knits is actually uh, a hand knit cotton tank top that I just wear for pajamas. So I think this yarn would work really beautifully for, for any kind of home wear um, or any kind of, you know, breezy, breezy garment. I think it's absolutely wonderful. So the Rose Stitch Dish Towel, free pattern by Pearl Soho. I will say, despite how much I actually enjoyed working on this, I don't know how much I would want to knit a full set of these. Um, like for example, like to gift knit somebody a whole set of these. I don't know that I found it that interesting or that motivating. However, if you wanted to put together like a little kitchen set um, or a little spa set 
as a gift for someone and include maybe just one really nicely knit hand towel or face towel or dish towel, I think that could be lovely. Um, as I said, I do have a handful of balls of this yarn left, um, but it was a lot of knitting. And, and at this point, I, I don't quite feel like doing more <laughs> of them. So, so I'll hang on to it and I'll see what I do with the yarn, um, but I very much enjoyed it. Uh, maybe I'll do more dish towels, just a different stitch to keep it interesting. Who knows? But this was, this was fun, a little something different for me. I liked it very much. The next thing I'd like to show you is a little bit of a two for one special. Uh, in my last podcast episode, I showed you this, which is the also free pattern from Pearl Soho. This is their arched gusset mitten. And this one looks huge because I knit it for my boyfriend, Adam. He wants a pair of mitts for the winter time. And so this is the adult large <laughs> in knitting for olive, merino and soft silk mohair, the colorway brown bear. So I'm working on the second mitten for, for Adam on double pointed needles and and I'm about to start the, the gusset. It is a dark color, so it's a little hard to show. But the new thing I'd like to show you is my second version of the mitten. So this is the same free pattern by Pearl Soho, the arched gusset mitten with a good handful of modifications. First modification is gauge. I went down to a 3.25 millimeter needle for this mitten to get just a more dense fabric. It's of course a different size for my hand than Adam's hand um, and a bit more of a snug fit because it is fingerless. I don't want it to be like flopping around in this area. Um, it's okay to have a bit more room in a closed mitten I think. So that's one modification and the other really obvious modification is that I've knit this to be fingerless. So this really the only difference or the only thing that I had to do to make the modification was stop knitting and bind off loosely. I just did a long tail cast on loosely and a bind off in pattern loosely and I think it turned out really nice and clean. I was saying in my previous podcast episode um, that I don't know, I didn't know how much I would trust this edge to not roll, but this is unblocked and I think it looks quite good. So I'm really pleased about that. And this particular mitten, I am knitting in more of the Hobby's Friends yarns. So this is Hobby Friends Fine Merino and Kid Silk in the colorway light gray. So here are the yarns, here are the yarns. Um, and you can see that, you know, this fine merino is really, really plump. It's super, super plush. I mean, compare it to a roughly equivalent sized ball of the Knitting for Olive. Merino, this stuff has certainly um, a thickness or a plumpness to it that you don't see in, in the Knitting for Olive Merino as much. So this is a really excellent and very affordable substitution for that Knitting for Olive yarn, in my opinion. I think in terms of gauge, despite this being more plump and plush, because that plushness comes from a looser ply, in the yarn. Um, I suspect that you'll be able to match gauges um, with this yarn and the Knitting for Olive as well. The Kid Silk um, is a yarn that I am also enjoying. I will say that, you know, the yarn combo isn't as soft and luxurious feeling as the Soft Silk Mohair from Knitting for Olive, but I think part of that comes from the fact that this actually has some wool content to it. So um, this is more akin to the Sen Niskarn Tin Lina because it has the silk core, the mohair fibers, but also about 3% wool content to it. 
And so I think the roughness is coming from, from that. It is still a nice yarn and a good um, option in terms of, you know, a silk mohair doesn't have synthetic fibers, but is more on the affordable end of things. So I'm liking these yarns. I am really liking the Pearl Soho arched gusset mitten pattern. I did knit my silver one here on Magic Loop and I'm working on atoms on double pointed needles and I do think that the Magic Loop is a bit easier for me to, to manage, a little less fiddly than working on the double pointed needles. Um, but I could also be a little biased in my assessment because you know by leaving out the decreases on this fingerless version I've spared myself from having to work some of the most fiddly parts of the pattern. So it's certainly excellent. I think mittens are a great gift knit. Um, you know everybody can use a pair of mittens one way or another. I need to to make sure I get mine done pretty soon too because the mornings are cold on the TTC. But I think it's a really easy modification to make. Um, the fingerless mitten is not quite like the penny glove by Petite Knit because I think that pattern you do the gusset increases here, whereas the Pearl Soho pattern sort of follows this lifeline of the palm. So it's a slightly different um, shaping overall. I like how comfortable the shaping of the arched gusset is. Um, but if you're looking for, you know, a free pattern that has a very similar aesthetic um, and overall vibe to the Penny Glove, then that fingerless modification of the arched gusset mitten uh, could be a great way to go because then you also have, you know, the full thumb and fingertips accounted for in the pattern too. See what I'm saying? Makes sense, right? My next work in progress exists in three pieces currently. It is my Hour Pullover by Sari Nordland. And this is a pattern I've been talking about knitting for a long, long, long time. A long time. I'm working this up in the Knitting for Olive Soft Silk Mohair in the colorway Oat and the Merino in the colorway Marzipan, which has given me this like very truly neutral color. Maybe it's a little cooler than neutral, um, but it's sort of like a, a, a beige oatmeal y, not quite cream, not quite beige. I don't know. It's an interesting color, but it's a neutral color. So I'm liking the yarn combo. Um, you've probably heard people, myself included, talk about knitting for all of yarns ad nauseum. So I'll leave that there. But a bit more about the pattern. Uh, the hour pullover is a bottom up raglan. So you knit a straight tube for the body and then you knit the sleeves with increases from the cuff to the top. You connect the pieces in the round and then you do your raglan decreases toward the neck. Now I thought that the raglan decreases would just decrease and then you do the neck but it turns out that the pattern has a chart where you're sometimes shaping the sleeves, you're sometimes shaping the body and the sleeves, and then you work the neck area flat, and then you pick up stitches and do the collar, which sounds like it's going to be more complicated than I initially anticipated. So, you know, I felt like nervous about knitting patterns before and it's always been fine and I suspect this will be the same um but I know I'm going to need like a good chunk of time to sit down with no distractions to get the pieces connected in the round and figure out how how all of this yoke shaping works a couple things I really like about this pattern are the twisted rib detail. I like knitting twisted rib. I like knitting through the back loop. Um, I find that this gauge 
it's quite easy to do. And I like twisted rib in a small dose, in a more delicate detail. Like you can see this is only about a few centimeters, a couple inches of twisted rib. And similarly, this is my completed sleeve. I've nearly done my second sleeve. Um, this is a relatively modest ribbed cuff, in my opinion. I don't like twisted rib in sweaters where it's like a cuff that comes nearly to the elbow or when it's a folded collar that's like 14 inches long. I'm not so much of a fan of twisted rib in that case. Um, in those cases, I think, you know, the chunkiness of a regular one by one rib fills out the space a little more and it has a bit better of a balance. I think when just twisted rib is too long, it looks more like stripes or like corrugated cardboard um, than real ribbing, if that makes any sense. Um, but twisted rib in a small dose, I think because it is so neat looking and, and delicate looking, I think, I think it's a nice detail in a smaller amount like that. I'll probably have to insert the picture of, of corrugated cardboard for you. <laughs> Um, in terms of process, there was something I wanted to talk about with my needles on this project, because in my last podcast episode, I showed you an acquisition. I purchased a couple extra cables for my Lika interchangeable needles, and I got the needle, uh, the cables that twist. So you can see I'm like rotating my needles here and the cable has a 360 degree free spin. Now the advantage for that is you can magic loop on a shorter cable because your cable won't get as twisted up. So I was able to knit this whole sleeve on these needles in magic loop. And I thought that that was great, really, really handy to have. I think getting twisted during magic loop is obnoxious and having aggressively long cables to do magic loop is also kind of annoying. However, I don't know if for regular, just in the round non-magic loop knitting, um, I'd like these cables as much as a regular cable because I'm gonna have to get up close and I don't know how well the camera will focus, but I hope you can see that cover my face, Let's see if that works. No, maybe you need to go like that. Anyway, this is a fixed, or sorry, this is a circular interchangeable needle cable from Licka, one of the ones that just came with my needle set. And this clear one is the free spinning one that I just purchased. Now what you can see hopefully with this original set is that very subtly, but certainly the black cable sort of widens towards the metal join of the cable. And that widening, I think, really helps with having a smooth transition from that cable to the needle. However, on these ones, because this is like a larger metal piece, I don't know why, but what they've done here is they've just inserted the clear portion of the cable straight into the metal bit. And so it's not as smooth of a transition. I found that while working, even in Magic Loop, my stitches were getting caught um, on that sort of portion of the needle. And I'm not sure if that's because, you know, it's four mil millimeter needles um, and it's a fingering weight with a mohair. So like the stitches are quite delicate. I don't know if you'd have the same issue with like a chunkier stitch, but it is something I've noticed. I've heard a lot of folks recently starting to talk more about those like free spinning cables. And I don't know if all of them are like that, like different brands are coming out with their version of the free spinning cables. I don't know if they all have sort of that difference in the join quality, but that is something that, you know, I noticed and I wanted to share with you. Next work in progress is one that I'm 
actually kind of sad to tell you about. Uh, this is my test knit for Sari Nordland's Kutar sock. And as you can see, it is not finished. So a little bit about the pattern first, because it is a beautiful pattern. Sari Nordland has a lot of different patterns in this Kutar sort of lace motif. And you can see it's this really beautiful, like arched, in intricate, you have these like, where are they, wrapped stitches. It's a beautiful lace motif. Um, she's got a pullover, a t-shirt, a camisole, a beret, um, the sock, the cardigans currently in testing, um, all of these Kutar designs, absolutely beautiful. And so I signed up for this test knit. And as you can see, it was going pretty well. But um, it's recommended that you knit this pattern on a 2.5 millimeter needle. And to adjust the sock size, you adjust the yarn choice, perhaps the needle gauge. Now I have a really long foot. I talk about this a lot. I have a size 10 foot um, for women's, but it's really narrow. On a 2.5 millimeter needle, I need to go down to 56 stitches for the sock to comfortably fit around my foot without being too baggy. So for this, because of the lace motif, I couldn't adjust the stitch count um, and I, I didn't really want to knit like anything thinner than a sock yarn that didn't really make sense for socks to me. So instead I thought, okay, I will knit on two millimeter needles. So knitting this on two millimeter needles, I found really challenging. The lace motif I liked working, I found that you know, with other lace patterns of Sari Nordlands that I've done before. She writes her patterns really well, really clearly, but the gauge was just so small and so tight that it was really difficult on my hands. And then a couple days before the test was due to, was set to be due, I snapped my needle. I was working on a pair of two millimeter long fixed circulars from Lika and the wooden needle piece just, just snapped. It just snapped. So I couldn't finish the sock in time for the deadline. And then I did order um, replacement needles, but by the time those needles came and I could have continued working on the sock, um, that was when, you know, my nonna became very ill and, you know, I just didn't have the mental capacity or the motivation to work on on a sock of this intensity anymore. And honestly, at this point with, with the gauge that I've had to knit at, um, I can't quite fathom doing a second entire sock. Um, you know, you see a lace yoke and you're like, wow, that looks like a lot of knitting. And then you think to yourself that a lace sock seems like less knitting, but it's a smaller gauge you're knitting really all the way around. So if you were to lay flat, all of the lace you have to knit in a pair of lace socks, it's significant. Like it's a lot of lace. So where I'm at with this right now is that it's a great pattern, just not in the cards for me at the moment. So I am gonna frog this and repurpose the yarn. And to tell you about the yarn, this is a hand-dyed merino nylon sock yarn from a boutique in Toronto called Ed's Mercantile. Um, it's downtown, it's on Bloor Street West, and I, I just picked it up from there. They don't do like just yarn, it's kind of like a tchotchke vintage store, which is really, really cool. Um, but a couple days after my last podcast episode went live where I showed this yarn for the first time, um, I got a DM from Ed's Mercantile and they were saying that somebody had gone in to, to purchase yarn from them upon my recommendation, which was really neat. So shout out to whoever that was. That's really cool. So this yarn has been really nice to work with. A beautiful tonal peach color, kind of like mild variegation. I'm really liking the color a lot and it looks so beautiful with this lace motif. It really, really does. 
I just know I'm not going to finish this soon. And even if I were to finish this sock, I have zero desire to do a whole second one. And it makes even less sense to have one unfinished sock than it makes sense to have one finished sock and no second sock, right? So like, what am I going to do with it? I'd rather just like use the yarn for a pair of vanilla socks. And if I feel like revisiting the Kutar sock again in the future, I'll get different yarn for it. So my last work in progress has a little bit of a story tied to it. Um, you may know that I went to an arts high school for dance. Uh, and in the six years that I went to that school, we put on the Nutcracker three times. And, you know, the rehearsals and spending time with my friends and my teachers and just the ballet itself uh, really are associated with some core memories for me and some of like the most, some most of the magic of the holiday season for me comes from, you know, the nostalgia around those memories and things like that. So recently when I was on Instagram, I saw an ad for the National Ballet's performances of the Nutcracker. Uh, they perform about two dozen shows at the Four Seasons in Toronto every every winter, um, but I've never seen the National Ballet's Nutcracker. Or maybe I did just such a long time ago when I was a really young kid, and so um, I just, I, I don't remember it. So as soon as I saw that ad, I, I told Adam, I was like, we're going to see that. And he was like, that's crazy. We can't pay $500 a person to go see the ballet. And I was like, okay, it's not that expensive. Um, and it's not that expensive. And he was like, oh, okay, then absolutely let's go. Um, so I booked us tickets to see the Nutcracker between Christmas, which our families celebrate, uh, and, and New Year's. So we'll have something to do in that weird random limbo week. But anyway, um, the ad in particular for the National Ballet's Nutcracker uh, was about the snow scene in the ballet, which is at the end of Act One. And snow is one of my most favorite scenes in the Nutcracker. Um, it was one of the ones that I performed the last year that I was in the Nutcracker. I did snow and I did marzipan um, and I was a parent that year in like the party scene. But anyway, um, I really love snow. The costumes are just glittery and fluffy and white and snow falls from the ceiling and it's a really long piece too. It's like over seven minutes long. So it's, um, it, it kicks your butt when you're, when you're doing the dancing. Um, and so I, I have so much respect for the dancers who do snow scene. Um, but just seeing the ad and seeing the snow and seeing the tutu and the tiara, I was just really captivated by the magic of snow scene and the magic of the Nutcracker. And it got me thinking about, you know, just wanting to embrace that feeling of ma magic and that feeling of nostalgia. Uh, and I started thinking about knitting home decor, snowing, snowy home decor for the winter time. Now, I'm not like one of those people who gets like a aggressively holiday Christmas mode as soon as Halloween is over, but I do like to indulge in festivities sooner rather than later. Um, to put it into context, I have had my caramel brulee latte from Starbucks, but I have not put on Michael Buble yet, if that helps provide any context. And no tea, no shade who any, to anybody who is already bumping Mariah Carey or Michael Buble, please do and please enjoy it. I'm easing into it. Part of me easing into it is thinking about how I want to decorate this year. I do have like a mini Christmas tree that I put up in my room that I've had for the past couple of years. Um, and I have these like really lovely silvery star ornaments um, and bulbs that I put on that mini tree. But I thought it would be sweet to have a couple little knitted home decor items to add to my space. So I started looking on Ravelry for tree patterns, like little 3D winter tree, spruce tree, juniper tree vibe. And 
there are a good handful of those kinds of patterns on Ravelry, um, just like basic cones, essentially. Some of them are garter, some of them have stockinette with pearl bump rows to look like a garland, um, some of them are knit to like actually have branches and things like that. Um, some of them had cables. There weren't really any that had that like fluffy, snowy, ethereal, magical vibe that I, I, I really wanted. So I thought to myself, I would just make my own, work up a random pattern, see what happens. So I pulled some yarns out of my stash to get started um, and really wanting to capture that like silvery, magical, magical vibe. So the first yarns I pulled are more of the Hobby Friends. This is the same fine merino and kid silk in light gray. But then I also pulled some scraps. I have this Rowan Alpaca Classic in the colorway Snowball or Snow or something like that. Um, Snowflake. I'm not sure. But this is 100% alpaca. It is a chain yarn, but it is super, super fluffy, really, really soft, beautiful to work with. Um, and I had one ball of this left over from my Luminin pullover, which I test knit for Sari Nordland this time last year. So I pulled out this, and then I thought it might be really interesting to add in this stuff. Now this is the Trailhead Yarns Cabot Trail, which is 100% Tencel lace waist, lace waist, lace weight yarn uh, in the colorway Oyster. So it's silvery, but it's got these like orangey and these blue, you can see a really nice blue speckle. Um, so it kind of looks like an oyster shell. So I thought I'd pair these yarns together. And this is what I have so far very much in its its early stages. Um, holding these yarns together and working on my three millimeter Chowgu needles, I am getting this really nice dense gauge. And so my plan for this is to knit a cone, but interspersed with the decreases to shape the cone, I'm going to do setup rows so that I can go back in once the cone is done, pick up stitches and knit ruffles. And my hope is that by knitting the ruffles, I will get them to sort of drape or hang off the cone in a way that looks like, you know, those trees that are really heavy with snow. I don't know how much of this or how far this Alpaca Classic is going to get me, my hope is to at least get the tube or the cone done with the Alpaca Classic, but I thought it could be fun to add this like interesting textural element to the tree by having the ruffles be different combinations of the yarns that I'm holding together. So it could be cute to have like a really fluffy like silk mohair -y ruffle layered on top of like a heavier but really shimmery tencel ruffle. Um, I don't know. I, I don't even know how I want to do the decreases on this, how frequently I'll be decreasing or how many stitches at a time I'm going to decrease. I really just cast on. Uh, I will keep notes on how I do this. Could be a really good stash buster if you have um, a lot of yarns in a similar color family that you want to just use up, or if you really like that um, colorful, eclectic, uh, really homey vibe for the holidays, I think, um, I mean, this doesn't exist yet, but I think just like, I think it's going to be an opportunity for me to be, you know, playful with, with my yarn and with my knitting. So um, hopefully I have a finished tree to share with you next time. Um, once I do all the knitting, what I think I'm going to do is um, stuff it with scrap yarns, like tails that I've clipped off of projects and things like that. Um, and then I'll probably cut a circle of cardboard and use a needle um, or cardstock and use a needle to actually stitch 
the edge of this around that so it sits flat. Um, my concern with knitting this shut as a circle will be that it won't have like the shape it needs to sit flat um, or the stuffing will make it sort of bulge out the bottom so it won't like look like it's sitting nicely. So I'm gonna try it that way and hopefully it turns out clean. If it doesn't, I can just unpick that stitching. I'll probably just use yarn to do that stitching. Um, I can just unpick the stitching and then pick up stitches and, and, and knit, knit the bottom closed. I don't think it's a big deal, so. Christmas tree. I don't know if you were able to follow along with all that rambling, but I think it'll be cute. If I do make it a pattern, the name that I'm thinking about would be like spruce it up because like spruce trees are, are Christmassy trees or like holiday trees, wintry trees, like spruce it up. Cheeky, right? Anyway, that was the last work in progress. Uh, <laughs> I feel like there's been a lot to show you and I've had a lot of like chatty energy, but I have more to show you, which is so exciting. The the last things I want to show you today are a couple of my recent acquisitions. So you may have seen, well, you've certainly, probably, you've likely, you've likely seen the Moby sweater by Petite Knit all over social media, um, as well as a little bit here on YouTube. And that Moby sweater, I think, is absolutely beautiful. A lot of people are comparing the Moby sweater to the Ingrid sweater by Petite Knit. I personally prefer the look of the Moby sweater a bit more because I think it has a bit more of like a, a classic look to it than the, the Ingrid sweater. So I thought it would be a nice challenging knit for me. Um, one of the reasons I don't like cable knits usually is that I find they can look um, a bit stuffy, but I really like the silhouette and the construction of, of the Moby sweater. I think in the right fibers at the right gauge, it can have a nice modern look to it while still maintaining that like classic cable knit essence. So. I started looking around at, you know, color yarn fiber options for that sweater and I saw Florence from Handmade by Florence um, upload her podcast where she shows uh, the version of the sweater she knit in Pier Gint from San Niskarn. Now the Pier Gint is a yarn that Petite Knit has used in a few patterns. Um, I know it was used in her Louvre sweater, um, but a lot of the knitters who have knit that sweater, the Moby sweater, in that yarn, um, or even other yarns, including Florence, have said that the pattern knits up small. Now, I don't know if, if that's like people not checking their gauge or petite knit knitting really loosely or... Um, I don't know what the deal with that is, <laughs> but I thought that if I was going to knit the Moby sweater, knowing how I already feel about cable knit sweaters, I would want to do it in a mohair free yarn because, you know, sometimes with mohair sweaters or sweaters containing mohair, um, they're not as wearable as other sweaters. If, you know, it's a light colored mohair and you're wearing dark pants, you'll see the mohair on the pants, um, or, you know, it just may not be cold enough to warrant a sweater with mohair. I personally like to have like tank tops layered underneath sweaters, not full long sleeve or t-shirts underneath sweaters. So, so I thought that, you know, doing the sweater in a yarn without mohair would make me more likely to wear the sweater is what I'm trying to say. And I thought that if that was going to be the case, why not just pick a yarn that is worsted weight 
So by going up yarn gauge and probably also up in needles, then hopefully I can adjust for or correct for um, the fact that the pattern knits up small. And I also ordered yarn to be able to knit a large um, as opposed to a medium, which is my typical size for petite knit patterns. Um, my sizing information is in the description box down below. I'll try to only mention the sizes of patterns I knit in the videos, but if you want more details um, on my measurements, that's in the description. So I ordered yarn, worsted weight, enough to get a large, and the yarn that I picked is the, drum roll please, because I've belabored the point for so long, Simply Wool Worsted from Knit Picks. So this yarn is in the colorway Wilhelmina, Wilhelmina, which is like this cool toned, pretty neutral medium brown color. You can see it's like not quite beige. It's actually a little washed out right now. Um, it's not quite beige. It's not quite a dark brown. I think it's very much a medium brown. I have used this yarn before. I used the colorway Winkle, which is a really light gray for my champagne cardigan by Petite Knit, uh, which I knit in January, January, February this year. Um, and I really, really like the yarn. It's got a really consistent ply. It is really easy to work with. It's just the right amount for me of like, rustic and soft. It has good toothiness to it. So I feel that, you know, a nice plump worsted weight, tightly plied yarn um, would hold up well with the cables and the textured stitches in the Moby sweater. But it also has just enough, you know, fluff to it. It's not as, um, it's got a little bit more texture to it than a superwash merino. Um, so I think it will still have uh, a nice kind of fluffed look for, for the Moby sweater without the mohair. Now the reason I picked this color is because I love, I love all the cream versions of the Moby sweater. But again, in terms of wearability, um, you know, I'm knitting my hour pullover in that oat mealy kind of color, um, but I just think a medium brown, there's space for this in my wardrobe. Um, you know, I haven't worn much brown before, but I also really don't wear cream. And I know historically I'm like scared of really pale or like white colors because I don't want to get makeup on them, don't want to get them dirty. Um, I'm a lab tech at the school that I teach at as well. So working with chemicals, dissection materials, things like that, like I wouldn't want to get it stained or ruined. So this just seemed like the more practical option um, without, you know, so it's not too light that I'm scared, but it's also not so dark that the texture of the set of the stitches in the sweater gets lost. So this was what I went for. Wilhelmina, the Simply Wool Worsted from Knit Picks. I got seven skeins of this. I used only five skeins of this for my Champagne Cardigan by Petite Knit. But again, I'm looking to get more of an oversized um, look for this. And it seems that the yardage requirements for the pattern itself, because of the textured stitches, are a lot higher than like a basic stockinette sweater. And then to get free shipping from Knit Picks, I wanted to pick up some sock yarn. Um, and so as I've told you, I am 10 out of 10, 11 out of 10 obsessed with this Magpie Fibers swanky sock in the colorway Voices carry and I found a yarn on Knit Picks that has a very similar vibe to, to this yarn. So let's take a look, shall we? This is Stroll Tweed 
fingering weight. So this yarn is a 65% superwash merino, 25% nylon, 10% Donegal tweed, and in the 50 gram ball you get 231 yards. So this is a light fingering weight or sock yarn and this is in the colorway Lost Lake Heather. So if we come closer, you know, you can kind of see that the base of the yarn is this heathering of that like moody green, seafoam green um, and warm brown that I really love in the magpie fibers. And then the tweed, the tweedy bits are brown and black and cream. So, you know, this is a tweed, this is a speckle, very different like yarn styles, but in terms of the weight of the yarns, um, the composition of the yarn, you know, this having nylon and cashmere, this having um, nylon and then the tweed as well, like the color stories, the color stories are so remarkably similar. Like I couldn't believe it when I opened this box. One of the things I really like about Knit Picks is from the yarns I've ordered from them, the colors in person look quite accurate uh, to the colors that are shown online. So I was just like beyond impressed when this showed up. It's also really, really soft. I've worked with Knit Picks um, Hawthorne Fingering, which is another one of their sock yarns, but that's a two ply. Um, and in my experience from working with that, it's nice, but this is just really soft. And the yarn itself is really, really round. So I'm looking forward to working with this. Um, I did see Anna from Brook Willow. I think she used the colorway persimmon in this exact yarn to make a pair of DRK everyday socks. So I have these two balls and I think I will probably also make a pair of ribbed socks or plain vanilla socks with this yarn. And um, the reason why, you know, I'm saying, oh, I want a whole sweater of this. I only got two balls of this yarn um, because I'm not 100% sure how I feel about tweed yet. Um, so I figured I'd see how this knits up as a pair of socks. And then with whatever I have left over from the socks, I will swatch with it held double. And if I like that swatch held double, and if the tweed is like not too overwhelming, because you know, if you're holding it double, you're getting twice the proportion of tweed um, per like inch of fabric or whatever. Um, if I like how that looks, then this could be a really solid option for an affordable DK weight sweater that sort of kind of scratches my itch for this colorway. I mean, it won't be completely identical, um, but I think that actually, you know, the tweed look may be better suited for me for a garment than the speckled look, because I think the tweed might just have a bit more of a classic vibe to it than, than a speckled, hand-dyed, variegated yarn. So, so I don't know. I was like, I'm, I'm amped about this. This is the Stroll Tweed Fingering Weight Lost Lake Heather from Knit Picks. I think I paid like $4 a ball Canadian for this. So I'm, I'm really hoping I like this because I also have a good, 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 good range of solid colors in this yarn. So, so I'm hopeful that this may become like a go-to commercial sock yarn. I don't know. Might be too soon to say, but it's exciting, right? So that is everything for today. I feel like this has been one of my longer podcasts in a long time. So if you've enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, give me a comment, let me know what you're working on. I am really happy to be back and I am feeling 
inspired and motivated to continue making videos for the rest of the year. Um, I know Vlogmas is coming up and I know that, you know, sometimes folks can feel a little too inundated with vlogs. So I'm not fully decided on whether or not I will be doing any vlogs yet. I won't be doing full on Vlogmas. There are some other video ideas that I would prefer to prioritize. Um, and you know, if you've seen my content before, you probably know that like I'm a bit more analytical. Um, I like to, you know, talk about my reflections on knitting a lot. And so there are some video ideas that are, are more true to true to that, um, that I want to explore over vlogs. But that being said, I may try to make more of an effort of including some, you know, clips from from my life, maybe like going to the Nutcracker or whatever like festive things I do. Um, if that's something you're interested in seeing, I may dabble with that. But you know, that's just like, the most unclear admin for the future of high fiber knits that I could provide. So thanks for hanging out. I again hope you enjoyed the video and until I get to see you all again, I am wishing you health and happy knitting. Bye everyone.